All right, so what we are going to be, uh, I'm going to sort of pick up where we left off in the last class. I'm going to take, I'm not going to go to, uh, do the usual uh, business that I do of re going over everything that we've done so far. I'm going to assume this is just a continuation of the last class. I'm going to take two steps back, just sufficiently, uh, um, just sufficient to maintain continuity. So thank you very much, exactly what I need. And thanks, Ethan. <laughs> so here we go. So the problem we're really dealing with is sequence to sequence uh, translation. So uh, here's the uh, basic problem. Some sequence of inputs goes in, x1 through xn. A different sequence, y1 through y1, ym comes out. Note n need not be equal to m. So uh, for example, speech recognition, a sequence of speech vectors go, goes in and out pops a sequence of phonemes or a sequence of words. The number of vectors that goes in is not related directly to the number of vectors that comes out other than maybe upper, providing you an upper bound. Similarly, machine translation, word sequence goes in, word sequence comes out. The, uh, again, there's, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between what goes in and what comes out. Or uh, if you're doing a dialogue system, the user statement comes in, the system's response comes out. Now, so here's the magical thing. We're going to use the same machinery for a bunch of different tasks, and it just works. Uh, the uh, question answering system, a question goes in, an answer comes out. You know, pretty magical, right? We're doing so many different things using the same basic mechanism. All you do, all you're going to do is to change the uh, training data. So uh, the uh, uh, key point is that the number of symbols in the input and the number of symbols in the output need not be the same they need not even be synchrony between the two. So uh, here, for example, I have two examples. One is uh, speech recognition, the other is machine translation. Now observe again in both of these that the number of uh, vectors or symbols on the input is not the same as the number of sequence vectors in the output. Now there's a fundamental difference between the two problems. In the first, when you see the signal for I ate an apple, the signal for I precedes the signal for eight, precedes the signal for and precedes the signal for apple. So the output is order synchronous with the input. It's not time synchronous, it's order synchronous. It's occurring in the same order, right? On the other hand, if I'm looking at machine translation, I ate an apple. Ich habe einen Apfel gegessen. So now, if you look at, look at the order of the input and the output, it's completely mixed up. So here, you don't even, don't even have a notion of a synchrony or an alignment. We are going to be dealing primarily with the first kind of problem today, where you have order synchrony. The input and the output sequences happen in the same order, although they may not be time synchronous. So speech, like speech recognition. So you have an input, which is a uh, sequence of vectors, all the purple boxes. Outputs occur at different times. You don't necessarily get an output for every single input. Now, the simplest case of this we saw in the last class was this one, where you have a sequence of, uh, of inputs and a single output coming, and a single output like uh, question answering or speech recognition. So, you know, speech recognition, a sequence of vectors goes in. When you're done seeing the entire sequence of vectors, you say, OK, I saw the phoneme R. Or if you were doing uh, question answering, a sequence of uh, words would go in. When you were done seeing the sequence of words, you would provide the answer. During training, we only define the divergence where you have an output. So the output is going to be defined only at the very end of the input. Unfortunately, this means that that one single divergence has to back propagate and provide training signals to every single box in the diagram. So what this, what this is really doing is ignoring the outputs at the intermediate steps. It's ignoring the outputs at time zero. It's ignoring the output at one. It's not as if the system is not providing any outputs at one, zero and one. Remember. Every column is identical to every other column, which means that at time zero, there was an output. At time one, there was an output. At time two, there was an output. We just discarded the outputs at time zero and time one as being uninformative or irrelevant. Now, this 
is perhaps suboptimal. So in a problem like speech recognition, it makes sense to believe that even the intermediate outputs really have make sense. So, uh, and this is very key. We're going to keep using this concept throughout today's lecture. So what I would do is, instead of just assuming that I have an R coming out at the very end, I'm going to assume that I want the system to output an R at every single time. So although the output is nominally only at the end, when you're done with the input, I'm going to assume that, that the outputs at every single time do matter. So now when I'm trying to train the system, the divergence that I'm computing is going to be a weighted sum of the divergences at the individual time instance. Now remember, when you're training a recurrent network, you're looking at the divergence between the sequences. Here we're going to assume that the, this divergence is the sum of divergences at individual outputs. And so this divergence, the total divergence here, is you're going to be summing over time, and you're going to be computing the divergence between the actual output and the target output. You compute a weighted sum. And now the weights themselves depend on the problem. If you're doing speech recognition, it makes sense that all of those weights are one. If I'm going R, it doesn't matter where you sample the output. The output must be an R. Thank you so very much. And someone should have photographed her coming in. Then I, can have, I could have put it up on next, in the next lecture slides. Uh, and uh, whereas if I'm uh, doing something like a question answering, having answers over here doesn't really make any sense. So in this case, you would just have a weight of 1 at the end and 0 elsewhere. Right? So regardless, we're going to deal with uh, this kind of output for now. And given we have outputs of the, assuming we as you assume outputs of this kind, now it's very obvious to us how we would train. This is just a, now we've just reduced this order synchronous but time asynchronous problem to a standard input output synchronous prop problem. And we've gone through how we would do back propagation for this kind of problem. Now here's a more complex problem. I'm going to be given a sequence of inputs. I have to generate a sequence of outputs. So this is again like the speech recognition problem, except now when you're looking at the inputs, I'm not telling you exactly uh, where the outputs happen. So now observe that this is a simple con concatenation of the uh, earlier problem that we saw, right? This is simply a concatenation of many copies of this basic model, one, one after the other. But the simple concatenation actually makes things very hard. So the real issue, the problem is we know the our system actually outputs something at every time. Which are the outputs we must actually consider? Because the order we know is not time synchronous, the order of the output is, is uh, order synchronous but not time synchronous. So to understand this, first we have to remember, recall what it is the network actually produces. At each time, the network produces a probability distribution over all of the possible symbols. So if I have here, for example, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven potential output symbols, at each time, you're going to have a probability distribution over all seven symbols. So what the network is really generating is a matrix of probabilities where each column sums to one. So given this, uh, what we can think of uh, as the output uh, is the sequence of symbols that has the greatest probability. So, and so, so now, remember, we've been speaking about this in the past too. When you're speaking of generating stuff, you have a probability distribution, you're picking the most likely symbol. So if I'm going to be generating a sequence, what you really want to do is to pick the most likely symbol sequence given the inputs. Make sense? We're going to be building on this. And so here's a simple way of doing it. At each time, I can just simply select the most probable symbol sequence, symbol. So say, for example, at this time, G had the highest probability. I'm going to pick G here. G has the highest probability here. I'm going to pick G here, F, F. I mean, it's not necessarily going to go sequentially bottom to top. You'd get symbols in some order, but this is what you would do. Now, remember, we really want to get order synchronous but time asynchronous outputs. So anytime you see a repetition of this kind, you have to make an assumption that 
this assumption really represents a rep repetitions of the actual symbol that must be output at the end. And so you can just collapse all of these guys and say anytime I have a repetition, I'm going to just collapse them into the final symbol. And so the actual output over here is going to be G, F, E, and clear, right? And so this is easy. Now, what is the problem of doing something of this kind? If the real output is a repetition, if there are two Fs, this cannot distinguish that there are actually two Fs in a series because you're going to be collapsing them. There's no, the logic is insufficient. To identify that there were two distinct Fs that happened, you just collapse the whole lot into one symbol, right? And then, of course, the uh, other issue is that the resulting symbol, may, symbol sequence may be meaningless. What's a feed? I have no idea. So uh, you can have external constraints. So the external constraints you can impose, and we won't go into this right now, but you will see towards the end of the lecture, if you have the patience to stay so long, to see how this might be done. The external constraints you will impose will ensure, must ensure that the sequence of symbols that you actually output represent valid words and valid word sequences, right? So we'll refer to the process of obtaining an output from the network as decoding. So what we've done is we've decoded the output of the network to get a sequence of symbols, in this case, G, F, E, and right? So now, here's the key piece. If I just pick the most likely symbol at each time, this is not necessarily the most likely symbol sequence because you're being greedy. At each time, you're picking the most probable symbol. But then if, there are any, if there's any external constraint at all, that external constraint may actually, or this, there, there, there are any other kind of priors, they may tell you that it's highly unlikely that an E will follow a B, right? And so those kinds of, that, that information is not really being considered. They're only, this is a perfect, this is a, uh, the, uh, this is greedy, and so, uh, more importantly, you're looking at the most likely time synchronous sequence of outputs. The most likely time synchronous sequence of outputs may not give you the most likely order synchronous sequence of outputs. There's a difference between order synchronous and time synchronous as we saw, right? We are collapsing the time synchronous outputs into the order synchronous outputs. And so this is a greedy algorithm which might not give you the most likely order synchronous sequence of outputs. We'll hold that thought for a very long time, for 70 minutes before we get back to it. But anyway, we've sort of looked at how to, when to output symbols and which are, which are the real outputs. We've sort of looked at it. Uh, we may go back to this later. But then now the bigger issue is how do we train the models? Now, training the models in the best case is fairly easy. Suppose I give you the input and I give you the output, training output, and I tell you exactly at what time each of the output symbols must be produced, no big deal. Now I have exactly these guys, I have the sequence of inputs, and I'm informed about the outputs that occur at each time, or the outputs that occur and at which times they occur. So now I can just compute the divergence with re of the target output with respect to the outputs at the times where the target output is supposed to have occurred or is expected to occur. And then I can, I can back propagate these divergences through the net and learn all my parameters. Or instead of simply assuming that I only have outputs at the precise instances, where instance where I uh, expect an output, I can actually assume that although the order synchronous output is out here, this really represents a repetition of B several times. And so this now actually sort of stretches the signal that you're, the, the training signal that you're providing the network, and uh, you're able to use this uh, um, uh, much more detailed uh, uh, signal to train the network. And this is the exact form of training signal that we're going to assume for the rest of the lecture. So although during training, 
the output target output is order synchronous but not time synchronous we're going to, we're going to convert it to a time synchronous output by repeating things right and now once i've done this what is the actual divergence that i'm going to uh, minimize the divergence is going to be the sum of the divergences at the individual instance so i'll be summing over time and computing the cross entropy between the actual target output and the output of the network itself. Now, here's what happens. The target output, this is something that you must remember. So if I have symbols S1 through Sn, the network at each time is going to give you probabilities Y1 through Yn. And the target output, there's going to be only one target output, right? So if I think of the target output as a one-hot representation, I'm going to have a sequence of zeros and a single one. So if I, so this is D, this is Y. So if I do a summation DI log YI, this is, all of these terms will disappear. All of these terms will disappear. All I'm going to be left with is, this is a minus, right? Minus log Y of target symbol. Right? This is, all, this is what you're going to be left with at each time. And this is very important. The divergence that you're minimizing, or the loss that you're minimizing, is the negative log of the probability assigned to the true symbol at each time. And this you would be summing over all time. And that is going to be the final divergence that you minimize. So if you were actually doing gradient descent, now remember, if you want to do gradient descent, you want, to, you want the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of the outputs, right? That was part of the back propagation. Now, e and any single output is going to contribute only one term over here, which is the log of the, the negative log of the target symbol at that, at that time. So if you take the derivative with respect to all of the, the probabilities of all of the symbols, meaning the derivative with respect to the entire output of the network, you're going to get zeros everywhere except in the term corresponding to the target symbol. And at that point, it's going to be just minus 1 over the probability assigned to the target symbol. Right? Nothing complex. This is, this is just straight up divergence computation. But again, these are all things that will come up, come up when we uh, go through the entire process of training. So this is easy. If I give you an input, if I tell you exactly where each output occurs, no big deal. Now I can compute the divergence. I'm going to repeat the, I'm going to create time synchronous outputs from the, from the uh, order synchronous outputs. And now I have a symbol at each time. I can create a divergence, compute a divergence. I can compute derivatives for the divergence. I can do the back, I can do back propagation. Everything is good. The world is fine. We are happy. Now, more likely, this is the much more likely scenario. When you're given an input, you're not going to be told exactly where each symbol occurs. So I'm told, I'm, for example, I might be given a uh, sequence of uh, the speech recording. And I'm, told, and I'm told that this recording represents the word sequence or the phoneme sequence, hello world. No one's going to come and tell you this is where H occurred. This is where A, A occurred. That information is not given to you. So uh, you're only given the sequence of output symbols, but no indication of which one occurs where. In this case, how do we compute the divergence? Because remember, for us to be able to compute the divergence, we need to be able to assign a unique symbol to every time instant. And that information is no longer being provided. right? So how would we do this? Now, if I roll this problem over to you, what would be your best first solution? Don't give me your most complicated solution. Give me a, this, the first solution that comes to mind. I can just randomly assign symbols, right? So I could start off by saying, I know the order in which they're occurring. So I can just randomly assign places where each of the symbols will occur. And this is reasonably perfectly reasonable. And then once I have done this, I can go ahead and train my network. Is this going to work? Not really, because this is a random assignment. But this is a good starting point. 
But then now this is going to give me a preliminary model. I can use this preliminary model to go back and re-estimate my alignment. So this assignment of time synchronous outputs to the input, that's what we will call alignment. So again, what you are really given is something of this kind. You're, you're given x1, x2, x3, x4, xn. And then maybe you're told that this corresponds to the symbol a, b, c, right? Symbol sequence a, b, c. So the output is much shorter than the input. So what we are going to do is to say, OK, try to come up with this kind of repetition of this guy, of the individual symbols, so that they occur in the right order. And this is what we will call our alignment. So this is the order synchronous output. And this is the input, right? So we're going to be stretching the order synchronous output so that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with the input. And this business of stretching is what I will call alignment. And if I have this kind of an alignment, then it's easy for me to train the network. We've already seen that, right? So what we are going to do is to start off with a random assignment of alignment of the symbols to the input. Then I can train my network. Then I can go back and re-estimate my alignment. And then once I've re-estimated my alignment, for each training instance, and how would I do the reassignment? You can do this using the decoding methods we've already discussed. We'll get back to that. Then I can go back, and maybe I start with this alignment. This was, this was my random initial guess. But then after I've trained my models, when I re-estimate it, I might end up with something like this, which is now A, B, B, C, 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 C. So in the process of training a network and re-estimating re alignment, the alignment has changed. So I can go back and now re retrain my models and repeat the process, right? So how exactly do I estimate the alignment? I've sort of magically just hidden this term of re-estimating the alignment into, this, into a few words. So let's see how we must do this. So again, the business of finding an alignment is this. You're given an order synchronous output. From that, you're trying to assign, determine exactly which of these symbols to assign to each input. And that must be done such that this occurs in the same order as this guy. So this is the business of aligning the output to the input, right? So here, for example, you might be given a sequence of inputs, symbols S0 through SK plus SK minus 1. So here I have ABC, so K is, K is 3, right? S0 is going to be A, S1 is going to be B, S2 is going to be C. And I have some n length input in this case, where whatever n is. And I want to find an expansion. So this is my expansion of my compressed output. So these I'm representing using uppercase S. These I'm representing using the lowercase s. So I have our yeah, so I would say S0, observe that the uppercase S's repeat. The lowercase S's have unique indices, right? So I'm saying the symbol assigned to time 0 is capital S0. The symbol assigned to time 2 is capital S1, and so on, right? Just the notation. So what we want is an alignment of the target symbol sequence, ABC in this case, or in my example, it's B. B, C, B, I, I want B, E, F, and E to my inputs, right? Now, what's the easiest way of doing it? Keep in mind that what I really get from the network is a vector of probabilities at each time, right? So given that I have a vector of probabilities at each time, I'm going to have, so you're probably, you're probably going to have trouble seeing these uh, things on the board, but let me try, right? So at each time, you have a vector of probabilities, P1, 
y1 through pyn at t equals 1, 2, 3, or t equals 0, 1, 2. So at each time, you're going to have a vector of probabilities, basically this entire matrix. And then you want to, say, align the sequence to, I can't see it myself. I don't know if you guys can see it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's hope you can see it. And if you can't see it, close your eyes, squint, and then you'll be able to see it, right? And so uh, now think of how I can align ABC to the input. I have all of these possibilities. I have, huh, where's my red? I'm going to keep changing between the red and the blue to, you know, something works, okay. So I have, I could do this A, B, C, 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 C. That's one alignment, right? I could be doing A, B, B, C, C, C. That's a different alignment. I could be doing A, A, B, C, 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 C. How many different such alignments can I get? An exponentially large number, right? Mm -hmm. I have to pick one of those based on this matrix of probabilities. Which one will I pick? So I'm going to pick the most probable one. As a heuristic, it makes sense, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to pick the most probable alignment of the target output to the input. How do we go about doing this? Now, one simple solution for me is to just go ahead and simply decode my output. I could just go ahead and pick up the most likely symbol at each time. If I picked up the most likely symbol at each time, am I going to get anything of this kind? Not necessarily. Because in this example, what I really want is uh, maybe I'm trying to align the input to this word beefy, right? But if I pick the most likely symbol at each time, at the very first time I got the symbol R as being most likely. So what I got as an alignment has nothing to do with my input. This is rubbish. This is not going to work, right? So how do I constrain it to actually give me an alignment of what it is I want? So firstly, if I do a random decode, just if I just go ahead and decode, I'm going to get symbols which are not even in the target output, right? So the first thing I must do is to eliminate all the rows in this table which are not present in my target output. If I do that, I can, so here I'm trying to get beefy. The only symbols that really matter are b, e, and f. So what I would do is instead of you know, blocking them out, I go ahead, run my network, I get the vector of probabilities at each time, I pull out the row corresponding to b, the row corresponding to e, the row corresponding to f, so I get these three rows on the top. And now, this is all I must work with, and I can just decode on the reduced grid. But if I just decoded on the reduced grid, I would end up, if I just picked up the most likely at each time, I'm probably going to get up, end up getting something like this. Is this guaranteed to give me beefy? No, right? Because although I get the right symbols, the order in which they happen might be quite arbitrary. So what you would get over here is, for example, here I've got beef fee. And this is not really an alignment of beef fee to my input, right? So I need more constraints. It's not sufficient for me to say I'm only going to output these symbols. I want to say these symbols must occur in the right order such that they give me an alignment of beefy to the input, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go back and pull out the appropriate rows, but I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to arrange them so that when I go from top to bottom, I get the output that I want. Right? So observe that the first row is b, the second row is e, the third row is f, the fourth row is e again. So although the network itself has only computed e, the probability of e once, this row has occurred only once in the output of the network. But when I, but, but when I pulled the rows out and created my table up there, I put two copies of e. Right? Questions on anyone's faces? No, it's very clear, right? All I did was grab it and make two copies of it. 
And now why do I want to do this? If now I'm this table, the upper table, represents a matrix of, of probabilities. I'm going to sort of pull a path through this matrix of probabilities with some constraints, and the constraints are going to ensure that, yeah. OK. Yeah. So and the constraints are going to be such that the corresponding alignment that I get, the corresponding sequence that I get, is going to give me the symbol sequence B phi. And what is the constraint I want? I want the path to explicitly start from the top left and explicitly end at the bottom right. Because I know the first symbol is B and the last symbol is E, right? And in this example, I have one, two, three, four. I have nine time instants, index zero through eight. I have four symbols, right? So how can I do this? I know that if I want to, that when I'm going in my path, every symbol, every row must be visited, right? So if every row must be visited, then at any time, if I'm outputting a particular symbol, then at the previous time, I'm, I, I should have either output the same symbol or the symbol just before it. This is the constraint. This is, a, this is the very simple, simple constraint that guarantees that all of the symbols occur and they occur in the right sequence. So for example, if at, ta at time zero, I'm, I'm out outputting the symbol bur, then at time one, I must either output bur again or I must output e. I cannot output fur because if I do, then I've skipped the e, e in between, and this is no longer representing a valid alignment, right? So these arrows that I have shown over there show what are the valid successors for any particular symbol when I'm trying to decode. Clear? Right? So, and in this particular example, each symbol has only two possible successors either itself at the next instant, or the next symbol at the next instant. So I can convert, think of the entire thing as a graph, starting from, from the top left to the bottom right. And I want to find a path through the graph from the top left to the bottom right, and specifically I want to find the path that has the highest probability. That is going to give me the most probable uh, alignment to the input. Right? And now, what is the probability of any particular path? The probability of any particular path is simply the product of the probabilities of the individual symbols in the path. So here, for example, the path which is this guy shown by blue, shown in blue, that has a probability which is y0b times y1b times y2e times y3e times y4f. So the y, the subscript represents the time, the superscript represents a symbol, and y represents the probability that has been output by the network, right? So, this clear? Nothing magical. We're just sort of explaining the representation, but everything is going to build off this representation. If you miss this, if you don't get this, the rest of the lecture is going to be lost on you. Right? So, any questions? Not necessary. You will, you're guaranteed that you're going to pick the most likely, most probable sequence just doing things in this manner. And we are, because remember, the probability, the only constraint I need is that it has to start from V and end in E. So if I find the path that has the highest probability, it is the most probable sequence, right? So how can I actually find this most probable path? I can. Firstly, there are an exponential number of such paths. You're going to have to evaluate all of them if you were being stupid. But what you will really do is to use the Viterbi algorithm, dynamic programming. Does anybody not know the Viterbi algorithm? OK, you don't. So I have to go through it. All right. No, no, it's OK. It's, 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 perfectly, it's, it's perfectly reasonable. I assume that out of the 200 people behind the camera, a certain number don't know it either. Right? So, the Viterbi algorithm is going to be, is based on a very simple observation. If I think of the best path, when I speak of the best path, I'm speaking of the most path with the highest probability, right? 
So if I think of the best path from, say, this guy to this guy, how many ways do I have of arriving at this node? Only two possible predecessors, right? Now, so here is the, here is the magic. The best path to this guy is either an extension of the best path to this fellow or an extension of the best path to the second one. There is no other possibility. Because if you, if you chose the second best path to the blue box, that already has a lower probability than the best path. It could not have extended to the best path to the final red box, right? So very simple. This is the basic logic that you're going to recurse. So if I want to write this down, the best path from y0b to y3f is either going to be the best, best path from y0b to y2e followed by y3f, or the best path from y0b to y2f followed by y3f, simple. And I can collapse these two and say that over all parents, I'm going to pick the, I'm going to pick the parent for which the best path to the parent itself is the best. And then I'm going to append the final symbol. Right? The notation's clear, I assume, right? And, or I can just say, this is the best path from this y0b to the best parent to which I attach the final symbol. So we sort of collapsed into saying, now I've reduced this problem to picking the best parent. And what is the best parent? The best parent is simply going to be the parent for which the score from here to here is the highest. Anything else is going to give you a lower probability, yes? The parent is all the symbols to all the nodes from which you can actually get to this guy. A parent is, yeah, there are two parents, right? Yeah? OK, so parents and children. Parents are nodes from which you can get to the node. Children are the nodes to which you can go from the node. So this logic is very simple, straightforward, nothing magical, right? And the Viterbi algorithm simply just builds on it. All you're going to do is dynamically track the best path from the source node to every node in the graph. At each node, you keep track of the best incoming parentage, the score of the best path from the source node to the current node through the best parent, and then com eventually compute the uh, best path from source to sink. So uh, here is the final overall algorithm. I'm using the same notation as here, y subscript t is the time. Superscript SR. Now observe that SR represents the symbol assigned to the rth row, right? So here, for example, S0 is B, S1 is E, S2 is F, S3 is E, right? So all of these values sort of conform to this notation that I've got over here. And so, Here's how I would begin. What is the best path to the top left block? Just itself, right? I'm going to incrementally build my best path from left to right. So I know, so the best path to the top left block is just a null. Uh, the best parent to this guy is just a null because there's nothing that happens before it, right? And the score of the best path to this guy is simply the node, uh, is simply the node score of S0. And we're going to assume that these guys are impossible so even if they, were, if they had a best path score, their probability score is the probability is zero. They have a zero probability, right? So, or minus infinity, whatever you choose to be, it doesn't really matter. Now, then I can go from left to right. Now first, there's a special case for the top row. For the top row, for this guy, there's only one parent. So what is the best parent? Just the one guy that it can come from. And what is the score? Is the score of the best parent the score now ref ref refers to the probability. Is the probability of the best parent times the probability of the symbol itself, right? Anytime you attach a new symbol to it, you're just multiplying the probability in. And so that's going to be the best score of the parent at time t minus one times the score of the current symbol. And then as you go down for the rest of them in the, in the column, you can just use this logic that first, for each one, for the symbol, you pick the best parent based on which has the highest probability. And once you've chosen the best parent, then all you have to do is to 
multiply the probability of the symbol itself to the probability of the best score to the best, to the best parent. And that is going to give you the best path score to the current node. Because you're just using the simple logic that we saw earlier, and we're extending it, right? And so I can, so having computed these terms for the first column, now I can use this little logic here to compute these terms for the second column. Then go ahead, compute it for the, so these are blanked out. Then I can compute it for the next column. As I, as I loop down, I can keep doing this left to right, right? At each time, what you will find is you're computing two things. For each node, you're finding the best parent, and you're computing the best path score from the beginning to that node. Eventually, when you're done, you're going to find the best path scores to all of the nodes in the final column. And for each of the nodes, you're also going to have the best parent. But we are only interested in this final guy, because we know that at the final instant, the last symbol is this one, right? So now you can trace your way back by just finding his best parent, which is this one, then finding that one's best parent, which is this one, then finding that one's parent, which is this one. You trace your way all the way back, and that's going to give you the entire path, right? And so now this gives you, given the current network, which gives you output probabilities for every symbol, it gives you the best, most likely alignment of the target symbol sequence to the input. Questions? Yeah. So the actual Viterbi for this search, I mean, Viterbi search algorithms do um, at least compare all the possible combinations at least once. So it's due to a exponential. No, it's not. Because think about this, right? At each column, so in each column, you're going to be going through n symbols, right? For each symbol, you are computing as in the worst case, you are going over all possible entries in the previous column. Mm -hmm. So, for e to compute a completely compute a single column, you need n squared computations, mm -hmm. and then you have t of these. So, it's n squared t. So, here, just look at this, right? So, at each column, so at each column, in the worst case. How many, parents do, how many parents does each node have? Just two, right? Mm -hmm. I, can, I can even make it really horrible and say everything is a, is a parent. So for each of these nodes, I have n terms to compute. Yeah. So each of these guys is going to take n computations, mm -hmm. right? And I have n of these. So the total is n squared. So each column is going to take n squared computations. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go over t, and do this t times. So it's n squared t. It's worst case, case quadratic in n and linear in t. Or you know, if n is the same as t, it's cubic in t, right? So it's no longer exponential. Yeah? Simple enough. And so what is the output of this algorithm? The output of this algorithm is a sequence of symbols. This sequence of some, OK, guys, I'm going to go way over time today. Today is Friday. It's spring break. You have lots of time. You're going to wait, OK? So uh, now, uh, so you have the output as a sequence of symbols, right? And now that I have a sequence, so I have some pseudocode for the Viterbi algorithm that you can check up later. But now that I have a sequence of symbols which has been derived from the current model, I can use that sequence of symbols as my alignment. Now I can compute my divergence, and now I can back propagate the divergence, and I can train my network. Right? Questions? The trusting, no, no, but you're, all, you're, you're always using the output from the network to compute the alignment. So you're doing that for every training instance? Yes, for every training instance, you're passing the training instance in, you're getting the matrix of probabilities, using the matrix of probabilities to compute a new alignment, right? And so you'd get this, so let, let me go through a couple of slides, and then maybe you can ask me the question again. 
But first, let's hold the thought, and let's assume that this is the alignment that you got. If you get this alignment, then the, the divergence is now defined with respect to the symbols in the best path, because the alignment was not given to you, right? So the best path estimated alignment. And then having done that, now if I'm actually computing the derivative of the divergence at each time, you're going to get 1 over the probability, minus 1 over the probability of the output in the estimated alignment for one term and the rest of you, right? So this, again, we haven't changed anything in the formula except that the probability has come for the estimated symbol and the estimated alignment. So this we are fine with. So I'll get back to your question, right? So the overall process is going to be something like this. I'm going to initialize my alignment. From the initial alignments, I'm going to train a model with the given alignments. Then having trained the model, I'm going to go back and compute, recompute the alignments for each training instance. Then I can use those recomputed training instances to go back and train my model. And then once I've trained my model, I can go back and recompute my alignments for each training instance. Does that make sense? Thank you, right? So what I can do is determine the alignment for every training instance, then train the model to convergence, and compute the alignment. Or I can do the SGD approach, right? For each input, I can just first find the alignment and then use the, use the estimated alignment to update the model. And this is clearly, the second one is clearly going to be far more efficient. And as it turns out, the second one actually works better. Questions? Yeah. So, so what is, this works, right? This makes sense. But if I told you this had a problem, what would you think the problem was? So you're guaranteed that you're, you're picking the most likely alignment at each time. Yeah, but the point is you're also going to get you're also going to show that when you pick the most likely alignment at the next time instant, you're sort of you're going to increase the probability of that alignment itself when you when you optimize the network parameters. So at each step, the probability of the alignment that you choose alignments that you choose is going to keep increasing. So the whole thing has a likelihood of probability maximizing or a divergence minimizing uh, characteristic. So yeah. It's guaranteed to converge in the same sense that SGD is guaranteed to converge, right? So, uh, because you're picking the most likely alignment, then you're increasing its probability. So it keeps improving, right? So in that sense, so the problem is different. It's dependent on Hira's initial an alignment. She gave us a random alignment. What if she gave us a really bad one? She forgot her morning coffee then it's not really going to give you, it's going to give you a really bad initial estimate, right? So it's prone to local optima, and it's heavily dependent on the initial alignment. So what is the alternative? Let's not align, right? Or let's not pick an alignment, let's consider every possible alignment. How would you consider every possible alignment? First, what are we really doing? We are estimating an alignment, and for the most likely alignment, we are computing a divergence, right? So, and what is the divergence? The divergence is the sum over all time instance of the local divergence, which is simply the negative log probability of the aligned symbol probability. This we've seen, correct? And this we are doing for the most likely alignment sequence. But here's what I can do. I can think of this entire graph as a probability distribution. Every path through the graph is a valid, though not necessarily the most probable alignment, right? So how many such paths do I have? I have an exponential number of such paths. So what I can do is that instead of committing to this one alignment, which maybe was the most likely alignment, I'm going to say, I can actually compute the, the probability for each of these alignments, right? I have the graph. I have all the terms. I can compute the probability for each of these alignments. 
And then for each of these alignments, I have a divergence for the alignment, right? This is the divergence for the alignment over here. And each alignment has a probability. What we did when we picked the most likely alignment was we just went through these P's, chose the P that was highest, picked the corresponding alignment, and chose that divergence. Why choose the one? Let's get a weighted combination of all of them. So instead of just picking the most likely alignment and then using its divergence, let's use the expected divergence over all paths. Yeah? I mean, where are the probability uh, come from? Have they been randomly generated by the model? Yeah, the initially, no, in, when you started off, uh, your, your initial parameter estimates are going to give you probabilities in the beginning, right? Yeah. yeah. They're not random numbers, it's a probability distribution. What we have really done, so, uh, so based on the current model that you've got, you've chosen the most likely alignment, right? Yep. So based on the current model that you've got, you're going to find the expected divergence. All you've done is change the perspective, nothing changed. Earlier, you initialized your model somehow. Based on that model, you picked the most likely alignment. Mm -hmm. Use the alignment to update your model. And then based on the new model, you pick the most likely alignment and kept repeating the process, correct? Yeah. So here we're going to do something else. So what you really did was you initialized your model somehow, then you pick the most likely alignment and then minimize the divergence for the most likely alignment, right? Here what, we, what I'm suggesting is that instead of minimizing the divergence for the most likely alignment, let me minimize the expected divergence across all alignments. Right, given the current model. So the expectation is computed using the probabilities computed using the current model. As the model improves, that expectation values will change. Those expectation values will change. So the current model you, uh, you're saying here is refers to the model that we trained for the, uh, in the first iteration? In the first iteration, it's some random initialization or whatever. That's our current model, right? Okay. And then from that, using that, you can what we did earlier was to compute a divergence for the best sure. path. And then you use that divergence to update the model. Then you have a new model, right? And then you use that new model to go back and estimate the, a new alignment and a new divergence function. Mm -hmm. And then you minimize that, right? So what we are going to do instead is, instead of picking a divergence for a specific alignment, we are going to use the current model and compute the expected divergence based on the current model. So all of these P terms are going to be functions of the current model, mm -hmm. right? And that's going to give me an expected divergence. Still lost? Mm, a bit, but it's okay, I have No, it's okay, we have time. <laughs> it's Friday, right? <laughs> so. Okay, so we are, I'm actually going to go through the toy, maybe, but let's see. So let's go back here, right? If I have an initial, so just look at the figure. This figure should perhaps explain it. Where did those Y terms come from? In the very beginning, where did those Y terms come from? We didn't assign the Ys. We assigned parameters to the network. Then we fed the input to the network, correct? So these Y terms came from I have to go back a bit. Bear with me and him, everybody. It's okay. And somewhere in between I should have got my clicker, this would have been faster. Right. So The machine is slow. Give me a second. OK. So look, what, what did we do? We had the initial network, correct? We had the initial network. And the network gave you these probabilities at each time. From these probabilities, you constructed this table, correct? So that's where the Ys initially came from. You actually had an initialized network. It consumed the input. It computed an, a 
uh, uh, probabilities for every output symbol at each time. That's what, because you have a softmax computing probabilities at each time for all the symbols. Correct? Mm -hmm. I have not lost you there. Yeah. OK. So from these, I have constructed this table based on my target sequence. I didn't lose you there either. Okay. Right? Or did I? For my training instance, I, in this case, I know that the target output sequence is beefy. Yeah. OK? So this was the output of the network. OK. So I just grabbed a hold of this B row and put it on top. Then I gra grabbed hold of this E row and put it second. I, gra I took, took this F row and put it third. And then the E row again, and this was fourth. So I basically composed the upper table from the table at the bottom. And now the probabilities are all from the network. right? I used that table to compute the best alignment earlier, yeah. and then used that alignment to go back and retrain my network, right? Mm -hmm. That made sense? OK. So instead of choosing any one alignment in that, what I'm saying is that I'm going to use all of the alignments with their corresponding probabilities. Alignments are not differentiable, but the divergence computed from an alignment is differentiable. Each alignment is going to give you its own divergence. Yeah. Correct? Depending on the alignment I choose, each alignment will give me a different divergence. So I'm going to, ex I'm going to compute the expected divergence across all alignments. Make sense? Right? And so that is what I'm going to minimize. Anybody else? Questions? I mean, so much the time complexity for this we will see. Right. So the problem here, of course, is that you're going to have to sum over an exponential number of alignments to compute the, ex compute the expected alignment, right? Except you don't. And the reason is, come on, move. We need things that move faster. You mean the mouse? Have to have a wide mouse. Oh, well, I could use that. Well, anyway, I think. So this, it's more convenient to use my finger so it's slower and you know it gives you time to understand what I'm talking about when I'm going strictly forward, but having a mouse to go backwards is convenient. Okay, so maybe I'll use it, but for now. So did I at least partially answer your question? Mm -hmm. I get the idea. Okay, so here's what I do. For any given alignment, for any given alignment, this is the divergence, correct? Where I'm for, at each time t, I'm computing the log of the probability assigned to log of the probability assigned to that time instant by the particular alignment, right? What I want to do is to take an expectation of this divergence across all alignments, right? Now, what is the expectation of a sum? Expectation is a linear operation. I can move the expectation into the sum, right? So while I can spend an hour or so giving you the intuition behind this, this you can take on faith. The expectation of the sum is the sum of the expectation. Beautiful, right? Is this, the, is this the entropy? Not really. It's a cross entropy. Between column by column. Yeah, but if we interpret y as just log two, then. Then that should be y log y. You don't have a y. Okay. Right? So, and so here's what we're getting you're minimizing, so at each time, you are minimizing the expected value of log y, OK? Now, you might wonder what the heck this is, but we'll get back to that. So basically, what we are really doing is you're summing over all time. You're going over all the columns. Within each column, you're, you're minimizing this term. 
But what exactly is this term? Look at, within a column, observe that there are, in this example, there are four nodes, right? So the, what we are trying to do is, in the perfect alignment, what is the probability that this guy will happen? This term, right? What is the probability that in the perfect alignment, the symbol at the fourth time instant is the second e times, you know, log y, y e4, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, in the perfect alignment, what is the probability that at time four, the symbol is f times the log of, you know, y4 f, right? And so on. You're just basically walking down the column and saying, what is the probability that this was the symbol that occurred at this time in the perfect alignment, based on everything that we know, right? And what is it that we know? We know the input, and we know the target output sequence, right? So you see what this formula is. I'm literally summing over the column, and over the column at each time, I'm computing the probability of this box, the a posteriori probability of that box, given everything that we know, and I'm multiplying that a posteriori probability of that box with the log of the probability assigned to the box by the network at the current time, or the current iteration of the network. Correct, so, uh, but we are summing over all columns. Yes, um, but then if you try to minimize such a uh, divergence, it will also mean that we also try to minimize some impossible passes because we never think about the order of stuff. We yeah. are, right, the graph is still there. The graph never went away. I'm still, I haven't eliminated the arrows, oh. right? So what is going to be the probability that in the perfect alignment, the second symbol is the for second E. It's zero. Okay, I see, I see. It never happened, right? The graph is still there. OK, questions? So this term over here is the probability of seeing the specific symbol S at time t, given that this, sim this symbol sequence is an expansion of this input. And you're multiplying it by the log probability assigned to the box and summing over the entire column, right? So the real challenge is computing this a posteriori probability term, right? And this a posteriori probability term, I'm going to spend two or three slightly convoluted slides. But this you get. You, you, you understand exactly what this is doing, right? And this, if I use Bayes' rule, this is simply the proportional, proportional to the joint probability of this symbol sequence and having that symbol go through this particular, and having that sequence go through a specific box. So what we are saying is if I just did an arbitrary decode over the output of the network, what is the probability that the output is going to be beefy? And when I get beefy, at time four, I'm going, to ha I'm going to be producing the second E, right? So that's basically, it's a joint, so I, I've gone from the conditional probability to the joint probability because that's easier to compute, right? So this we found. So let's say in my example, T is three and R is two, right? So the blue box is computing this for one. So what exactly is this probability, right? This probability, is the probability of going through this box and simultaneously producing that symbol sequence. And maybe I'll skip the next couple of slides, go through this on your own, but the overall probability that you're really looking at is the total probability of all paths through this graph that go through that node. That is the probability of producing that symbol sequence beefy and being at time three uh, produ uh, and, the prob and producing symbol E at time three. 
Make sense? Right? So the total, so this probability that we want over here, this ugly term, is simply the probability of the portion of the graph that goes through that box. And there's a great deal of gobbledygook arithmetic that I've written over here. But what the gobbledygook arithmetic really says is that I can factor it into two portions. The graph from the beginning till that box, and the graph after the box. So the total probability is going to be the probability of the graph until that box times the probability of the graph after the box conditioned on the probability of the, the you know, conditioned on the first subgraph. So the total probability of the entire graph is going to be the probability of the blue portion of the graph times the probability of the red portion of the graph conditioned on the blue graph. Right? This is just straight up. Bayes rule. And here's something magical that happens in a, uh, I'm going to see if I can skip stuff. OK. And here's something that happens. Now, think of a recurrent neural network. If I give you the input, right, where is the information about recurrence hidden? In the hidden layer, not in the output, right? unless you feed the output back to the input, right? So the probability of yt, given yt minus 1 and h, is simply the probability of yt given h. Because, there's no in, because the outputs are, are derived from the hidden layer without any direct dependence on the previous outputs, right? The direct dependence on the previous outputs only happens in Knox networks. We saw that. But for the rest of them, the recurrence is strictly through the hidden layer, correct? And the hidden layer is deterministically dependent on the input, right? So which means that if I go back to this network, if I'm assuming that the input x is given, the probability of this portion of the graph is independent of the, pro of the previous graph given the input, because the graph only considers the outputs. And the outputs are conditionally independent given the input. Does that make sense to you guys? Right? Again, this has to do with the fact that when I'm actually doing a recurrent network, in a recurrent network, what happens? I have x, x, x1, x2. I have a hidden layer. I have a hidden layer. This feeds here. And there's some output node, right? So this is y1, y2. y2 has no direct dependence on y1. If I give you this guy, then y2 no longer has any dependence on y1 because all the information about y1 is already captured by this node over here, right? So if I give you the sequence of hidden inputs, this has no direct dependence on this output, unless I do something of this kind and I feed the y back in, in which case there's a direct dependence. You see what I'm talking about, right? As a result, you get this very beautiful situation where this, the probability of this red graph is independent of the probability of the blue graph. So the probability of the entire graph can be decomposed into two portions. One is the probability of the red graph, which I will call the forward probability, and the other is the probability of the blue graph, which I will call the backward probability. But they are both, there's one thing in common to both portions of the graph, that both are portions of a graph that go through the symbol E at time 3 in this example. right? So I will call this forward probability alpha TR. I'll call the backward probability beta TR, because it's anchored to TNR. Right? But now, the total probability of that portion of the graph is going to be alpha tr times beta tr. Yeah? How do you determine these two graphs? So these, how do I determine these two graphs? I've already, if I can do the Viterbi, I can do this, right? So think about this. Every symbol is going to have two children, either itself or the next symbol. So I can draw the graph. So for at any portion, 
I know that I, know I can actually walk my way back through the parents, and I know the subgraph. I can wake, walk my way forward through the children, and, and I know the subgraph. But we'll look at how we actually do this computationally, OK? So, but here is the point. Now, the magic can des descends to computing the alpha and the beta terms. If I compute the alpha and the beta terms, then I can compute the probability of all paths through this node, right? So let's, let's look at this first term, which is the alpha term, right? The alpha term is the probability of this graph. It's the probability of all paths that start from the source and end at e at time 3, the first e at time 3, correct? But then what, there are only two ways of arriving at that destination node. What are the two ways of arriving at the destination node? The two parents, right? And they are all, they are, you either arrive through one parent or you arrive through the other parent. So the probability of, the subgra of that graph is the sum of the probability of two subgraphs. Is the probability of arriving the entire subgraph that arrives here times coming here, right? Plus the probability of the entire subgraph that arrives at the second node times coming here. Make sense? Right? Because there are two subgraphs from which I can actually en end up at that node. Once I have done this, the problem is solved. Why? What is the probability of the entire subgraph that arrives here? This is so, if I say that the probability of the entire subgraph that arrives here is alpha 3e, what is the probability of the entire subgraph that arrives here? That's just alpha 2b, right? The probability of the entire subgraph that arrives here is just alpha 2e. I've just defined alphas at any time in terms of the alphas at the previous time. Right? So I can literally write alpha 3e is alpha 2b times y3e plus alpha 2e times y3e. Make sense? Just trivially decomposed it, right? I can generalize this. So anybody have any questions about this? Shalene? No? You're looking dopey. Mm -hmm. Wake up. Mm -hmm. So anybody have questions about this? This has got to be clear, right? Just, is this clear? Or is there, there's a question on your face? I mean, I think I'll have to look over it a little bit more detail afterwards. So, but did I lose you? OK, fine. I'll trust you. Now, if I do this, I can generalize this. So what is the magic of 2b and 2e? These are the two parents of 3e, correct? So in other words, I can generalize this whole equation. And I can say that alpha tr is the sum over all parents or predecessors of tr of alpha t minus 1 q times y to y tsf, right? I've just generalized the formula. Make sense? Right? Very straightforward. Nothing magical. There's a lot of gunk on the slides, which tries to give this to you with a little more math. But really, you don't need it. This figure ex is completely self-explanatory. You guys, make sense? Yeah, OK. And so. In our particular example, I'm just going to say alpha tr is going to be because each node has only two parents. It's alpha t minus 1 r plus alpha t minus 1 r minus 1 times the probability of the current symbol. Very straightforward. And that gives me the complete everything required to compute every alpha for every time. This recursion gives me the complete formula, right? I have the constraint. So what is alpha 0, 1? Alpha 0, 1 is going to be y0, b, right? is the entire subgraph that goes into, the, into that first node. And then alpha 0, 1 is going to be 0 for all of these guys, because you know that the first, no, first, at the first time instant, you cannot be in any of those boxes. Right? I mean, our constraint is that the first symbol must occur from the top left box. 
So for the rest of them, the alpha has to be zero. There is no subgraph which arrives at those points. They have a probability of zero by our constraints, right? And then subsequently, so that's going to give you, give you this term for the very first symbol at the top left corner. And then subsequently, it's very straightforward. For the first guy, for each guy, this uh, arithmetic is kind of the, the uh, uh, algorithm is fairly straightforward. But what we are really doing is we are summing the alphas over all of the parents of that node, and then and then multiplying the current symbol probability to get the alpha for the node. You do this going down the column. And you'd get the alphas for every term, right? And you can keep doing this. So you do this for the second column. Then you do this for the third column. You do this for the fourth column. Eventually, you're going to get your alphas all the way to the very end. What is the computational expense? n squared t, right? It's exactly the same as. Uh, the Viterbi algorithm. Okay, so we figure out how to compute this alpha term, right? I can replace the first term over here when I'm trying to compute the total probability of all nodes through that all of the subgraph that goes through the node. There are two components. The first is the alpha tr. I know how to compute it. I have the algorithm to compute it. So now. The term that is left is how do you compute the probability of the blue subgraph, right? I'm going to use the same trick of decomposing it. This is what I need. This is the term that I need to compute, beta tr, right? Let me do this again. Uh, so I'm going to draw the graph in this manner. Beta tr is the probability of the exposed subgraph and not the orange box. The reason I've drawn the orange box is that the orange box represents TR. The lower subgraph is with respect to the current time and the current symbol, right? That's all. The orange box is my anchor. That is the node to which the graph is a, ch is a child, right? So if I have this, oh man, I'm going to go so over. But anyway, uh, this is, uh, here's how I can write this probability down, right? This guy has what are the two children of the orange subgraph? So there, if you look at the subgraph, right, I can either start at the first box or at the second box. Right? These are the two children of the orange graph, orange box. Right? So I can say that this guy is the probability of the subgraph that starts in the green box plus the probability of the subgraph that starts in the red box. Right? Very simple. I haven't done anything fancy. I've just sort of split it into two. Or what I will do is I will pull this particular probability out, y4f and y4e out. And so, so that's this guy here, right? And now I'm going to pull the y4e and y4f out. And this is still the same probability that I'm writing, right? But now the term inside the parentheses, that looks familiar. That looks just like the guy on top. It's just one step down, right? Make sense? Yeah, you're looking. OK. And you can see the symmetry. So what is this guy? What is this box? This is going to be the beta term crystal corresponding to this orange box, right? This is going to be the beta term corresponding to this orange box. And that is going to be simply beta 4, 1 plus beta 4, 2. Trivial. And I can generalize this further. And I can just generalize this in terms of, so in our equation, it's going to be uh, for to compute beta tr, I'm going to go over both of its children. For each child, I take the pro node probability of the child and multiply it with the beta t for the child. And then I sum the whole thing up. Or if I want to write this in generic terms, the beta tr for any node tr is the sum over all successes, all children, of the probability of the node probability for the child times the beta for that child, right? 
very nice closed form solution. And now I can use this in a backward recursion. The way I would use this in a backward recursion is first, I know that there can be no subgraphs for the upper guys because I'm required to arrive at the bottom right corner when I'm done with my alignment. So I'm going to assign a probability of one to the bottom right beta. And then I work my way backwards. Because, and the reason we are working our way backwards is that each beta is defined in terms of the betas at the next time instant, right? And so from these now, I can compute the betas of the previous time instant and the previous time instant and the previous time instant and go all the way to the beginning. And so now I've computed the betas for the entire graph and the computation again is n squared t, right? And so having done all of this, I now have both the alpha and the beta terms over here. And so the joint probability, the probability of all paths that go through the colored subgraph is going to be alpha tr times beta tr. Yeah? But this is the joint probability of going through this node and producing this symbol sequence. So if I want the conditional probability of the node given the symbol sequence, what do I do? I normalize. I'm just going to divide by the sum of this alpha. I'm just going to, be, I'm just going to divide by the sum of the products of alpha and beta across the column. And I'm going to call this the posterior probability of the node, given everything that I have, right? So questions? So once you have this, there's one final step which gives us the entire solution. So this is clear, right? And this is simply the conditional probability of the node given the entire input and the target output sequence. And you might have lost you, you, you might be lost by now. You know, what are we talking about? Where is all of this coming from? Remember, we were looking at the expected divergence over all possible alignments. And the expected divergence simply ended up becoming the sum over all time instants of the expected local divergence within the column. And the expected local divergence is simply going to be the sum over the column of gamma tr times the minus the sum over the entire column of gamma tr times the log of the probability of the symbol within each box in the column. So we just brought everything back. This is the divergence, right? And now if I want to do backprop, what do I do? I have to compute the derivative of this guy with respect to each of the output symbols at each time. So if I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output at any time t, I'm going to be computing the derivative of this time with respect to the probabilities assigned to each symbol. And now if that symbol is not part of the target output, the derivative is going to be 0. So you're going to get non-zero terms only for the symbols that are in the target output, but not, unlike in the previous case where only one term was non-zero, here you're going to have a whole bunch of non-zero terms every symbol that actually occurs in the output, right? And so now these terms must be computed from the derivative over here, right? And it's very easy. If you actually look at there's one final trick. Observe that for E, for example, if the symbol E, if I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to the probability for the symbol E, the symbol E occurs in two different rows. Correct? Over here. So what we will do is to actually sum the derivatives at both, or the divergences at both to get, or rather sum the derivatives at both of those locations to compute the derivative with res respect to the symbol E at time t. Right? That's, that's the only extra. So you're going to be summing over all rows such that the output symbol was whatever you had you wanted. And within each row, you're going to be computing the deri this derivative, and you're summing them all up. And how exactly do you compute this derivative? It's very straightforward, you know, straight up chain rule. There are two components to it. One is gamma over y. The second is the derivative of gamma with respect to log y. And gamma is a function of y itself, because y is in the graph, right? It turns out the second term, they're taking the derivative of the second term 
is not very tedious, it's fairly straightforward, but for some reason, pretty much all of the literature only uses this, this first term. And you can get away with using the first term because it turns out that it's a perfectly good explanation if you think of it as doing a maximum likelihood estimate as opposed to minimizing the expected divergence. Right? And so now we know how to compute this term. And having done this, so we are actually able to compute the derivative with respect to every one of the symbols at each time for the network, which means now we need have all the terms required to perform back propagation. And so if, I'm, if I have the overall training sequence, uh, training procedure for sequence to sequence, I'm given input and output sequences without alignment. I must train my models. Here's what I do. Step one, I set up my network. Typically, it's a many-layered STM. Initialize all the parameters of the network. Step two, in the forward pass, I'm going to compute all of these probabilities for every symbol at each time. Then step three, I'm going to pull out the appropriate rows from this probability table to compose the upper table, which corresponds to the output that I really want from the network. Right? Step four, I'm going to, that's step three and four. Step four, five, I'm going to compute the forward backward on this graph to compute all of the alpha and the beta terms. And then step six, I'm going to compute the divergence, the derivative of the divergence with respect to the outputs of the network at each time, which of course we know how to compute. This is step six. And now you'd aggregate these derivatives over many batches and pass them through the network for back propagation. Okay. Questions? No? Okay. So, story so far, this whole thing is what we will call connection as temporal, I forget what the final C for, right? Is for. Does anybody remember what the classification. classification, thank you, right? So, uh, uh, here's the whole thing. Sequence to sequence networks with ir with, with, which irregularly output symbols can be decoded by Viterbi decoding, or uh, for training, they require alignment of the output to the symbol sequence for the training, and this alignment is generally not given. So you can either train by iteratively estimating the alignment and then updating the models, or comp minimizing the expected divergence over all alignments, right? I'd, you know, you're just probably waiting for me to say, we are done, you can go, but then I promised you an extra half hour, so here comes. There's a key problem, right? We haven't solved one fundamental problem. So think of this. Suppose you have a decode, a Viterbi decode, which gives you R, 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 O, 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 D, D. Is this the word rod, or is, the, is this the word rude? Both of them are valid words, right? How do you know which one it is? Do you know whether you should be squishing all of the O's into a single symbol, or do you, do you have to squish them into two separate symbols? There is no way of determining which you must do based just on this output, right? Yeah, but you know, can we actually do something within the model? That is the question. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. So this is exactly the same problem that we were speaking of, speaking of earlier, right? But do I know if it's a single F or two Fs? I have no way of knowing. So now, first thing, this kind of problem doesn't always occur. Your problem might have natural constraints which says a symbol cannot repeat in the compressed symbol sequence, right? So for example, if I'm doing speech recognition and I'm trying to recognize phonemes, but I'm splitting the phonemes into three subparts, then I can never get the second part of a phoneme occurring immediately after the second part of a phoneme. Whatever, after the second part of a phoneme, I must get the three third part, right? If the second part occurs again, it's just like an extension of the same basic unit. So there are portions, problems where this repetition is not an issue. It's not really a concern. But then things like spelling or writing or other, other such cases, this repetition can indeed be a problem, right? And so that's what we're going to have to deal with. 
So here's how we will do it. We're going to introduce an extra symbol whose only purpose in life, it's really, I mean, it's, it, you really have to envy this symbol's job. It's very easy. It has only one job. It has to separate repetitions of other symbols. That's about it. We'll call it a blank, but it's typically represented using either a blank or an underscore. You can choose a symbol, a symbol of your choice. It doesn't matter. The concept is important, right? So I'm going to use this hyphen. And this hyphen is an extra character that the network can now output. So if you did a best, most likely decode, for instance, the most likely decode may end up something like this, RRR, blank, 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 OO, blank, 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 DDD, right? So when you have something of this kind, blanks have no significance by themselves. That's going to collapse. That's just going to become rod. But then, suppose the blank occurs between one instance of between repetitions of R, like RR blank R. This blank basically separates the sequence of Rs into two. These repeated Rs collapse into a single R. The next R becomes an R by itself. So this one's going to collapse to RRO again. I have a blank between D and DD, so that's going to be DD, right? You see what the blank is doing over here, right? The only job of the blank is to separate repetitions. If a blank occurs between repetitions of a symbol, then the two instances of the symbol on either side of the blank must be separately grouped. If you have, so here, for example, I have multiple blanks within D. So if I collapse this, this is going to be one D. These four Ds are going to become a second D. This is going to be a third D. So this is going to be R, 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 O, O, D, 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 right? And now we're going to use this artifice of the blank to figure out how to deal with repetitions. OK? And first, of course, for the blank to be hypothesized, the network output must now have this extra symbol in its vocabulary, which is the blank. OK? It's not just the standard symbols anymore. You have this extra symbol, which is the blank. And you will be computing probabilities for it also at every time. And now, let's say your decode was something like this. This never touched the blank, right? If this never touched the blank, this is simply going to be B phi, easy. Because the sequence of E's collapses, collapses to a single E, the sequence of F's collapses to a single F. Uh, but now, suppose my decode is like this. The first blank doesn't matter, right? So this is still going to be B. These E's are going to be collapsing to an E. These blanks will no longer matter. These F's are going to collapse to an F and an E. So this is still beefy. OK? But now suppose I have this as my decode. Then I have the B again. I have E. I have an F. But then I have a blank, and then I have an F. So this is going to be B E, right? You see what I'm, yeah. So how do we insert? Let me get to that. OK. This has to go do with how you compose the graph. Right? So this is how we composed the graph earlier when we were doing beefy. I've changed, I've changed from beefy to beef simply because I wanted a repetition. All right. So if I did this, this is how you would compose the graph. But here is the problem that in any path, if you collapse the two E's, uh, then you, you would collapse the two E's in sequence. So this, is, this doesn't distinguish, distinguish between B, E, E, F, and B, E, F, right? So this graph is inac inaccurate. But then we're going to modify this graph like so. You would introduce a blank between every two symbols. You would also introduce a blank before the first symbol and a blank after the last symbol. right? And now, here's how I compose the graph. I'm allowed to have a blank before the first symbol. So at the first time instant, I can have either a blank or the first symbol. I'm allowed to have a blank after the last symbol. So at the last, last time instant, I can either, have the, either find either the final symbol or a blank. In between. I'm allowed to, I may or may not have a blank between two symbols which are different. 
But if two symbols are the same and two sequential symbols are the same, I must have a blank in between, right? All of those constraints are embodied in this graph. So observe what is happening over here. I think uh, the next figure should actually, uh, so the edges here are such that all paths from the initial node to the final node unambiguously represent the target symbol sequence. If you use the blank collapse rule, right? At the first time, you can either have a blank or the initial symbol. At the last time, you can either be the final symbol or a blank, as I mentioned. But then in between, here's what you've got. Observe that I'm, not, I've, I'm, now, I'm adding arrows which skip a row, but only in very specific places. So how I'm adding arrows is actually being shown out here, as you can see, right? So I'm adding arrows from Burr to E because in my decode, I'm allowed to produce an E immediately after a Burr. On the other hand, I'm also having the arrow from Burr to blank and blank to E because that is also valid. Both of them are perfectly valid, and both of them will collapse to the symbol sequence B, right? But then, when it comes from E to E, I cannot have an arrow because if I have an arrow, then the two E's will get collapsed to a single E, right? So between E and E, I will have a blank which cannot be skipped, right? And then again, between E and F, I may or may not have a blank, so I have a direct connection from the E to the F. Now, I don't have connections between blanks and blanks because if I did, the intermediate symbol would get skipped. Now, if you take any path from the top to the bottom in the graph to the left, it's going to give you bur E, E, F. It doesn't matter how you take it, it's going to give you bur E, E, F, right? Every single path. And now this graph basically is just following the same rules except the arrows are to the next time instant, right? So I'm, I'm allowed to go from bur to E, so I have this arrow. I'm allowed to go from E to F, so I have this arrow. But I'm not allowed to go from E to E, so you don't have a skip arrow from one E to the other. See how the graph is formed, right? Very straightforward, nothing really fancy. We just basically made the graph, composed the graph such that it embodied the constraints about the blanks, okay? And now we have the modified forward algorithm. The modified forward algorithm is gonna be exactly the same as before, except that when you speak of parents and children, the parents and children are going to be with respect to this new graph. So you can do the forward algorithm and the backward algorithm using this graph and uh, the same logic still holds, right? Yeah? And so this is basically uh, uh, the uh, actual, so in the forward algorithm, you're gonna find two separate conditions for this graph. Sometimes you'll have two parents, sometimes you'll have three parents, depending on the con constraints of the graph. Look at the slides for the details, but you should be able to figure this out yourself, right? The same thing for the backward. You start at the end. So the forward algorithm, the one extra thing that you're gonna have is that at the first time instant, you're actually allowed two nodes in the beginning, not just one, because you're allowed to either be begin at the blank or the first symbol. So also in the backward algorithm, at the final time instant, you're allowed two symbols at the end, because you're either allowed to begin at the blank or at the final symbol, and then you work your way backwards. And the overall training process is very simple now. Given input and output sequences without alignments, if you want to train models, same thing. You set up your network, and I'm speaking of unidirectional LSTMs, but it doesn't have to be. This, you know, how you compute the probability matrix of Y can use a unidirectional LSTM, it can use a bidirectional LSTM. It doesn't even have to be LSTMs. It can just be a sequence of MLPs. Because as far as the upper CTC algorithm is concerned, it is only worried about having the vice. It doesn't care where the vice came from. The vice could have come from a convolutional network. It doesn't really matter, right? So given this, now step three, after initializing all the parameters of the network, you're going to include a blank symbol in the vocabulary now, right? 
the first thing you will do is you'll pass each training instance through the network and compute all of these probabilities, including probabilities for the blank. Then you would compose your graph. And uh, first you'd compute, pass the input, uh, pass the training instance through the network and compute all symbol probabilities and use the symbol probabilities to compose the graph with the appropriate edges. And then perform the forward-backward algorithm to get the alphas and betas, compute the derivative of the divergence, which the formula is exactly the same as before. And now you can pass the derivative of the divergence back down through the rest of the network. Right? Very straightforward, nothing fancy. So this overall framework that we saw is referred to as the connectionist temporal architecture, or CTC. It applies when duplicating labels at the output is considered acceptable, and when the output sequence length is less than the input sequence length. Questions? I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes on a problem that I alluded to at the very beginning of the class. So if you have any questions, ask them now, or else slide on. Anything on Piazza? No. There's nobody on Piazza. Everybody's on spring break, right? <laughs> so an old decoding problem. I told you that when I pick, when I use the uh, greedy decoding algorithm to pick the most likely alignment or the most likely symbol sequence, this was not necessarily optimal. Why? Because the most likely symbol, you know, the most likely time synchronous symbol sequence doesn't necessarily represent the most likely order synchronous symbol sequence. To compute the probability of an order synchronous output, you must sum over all alignments. And the greedy algorithm is only picking one of these alignments. Right? So that is an issue. It turns out that this business of introducing blanks somehow makes things easy. Even the simple greedy algorithm just works fine uh, if you introduce blanks and the network is properly trained. So what, what happens is that you will find that at most times, the most likely output is the blank, except when there's a symbol change, at which point the probability of the, most, of, of the appropriate symbol is going to jump up. And so a greedy algorithm decode will actually give you a pretty good decode output uh, using these blanks in the CTC. Nevertheless, if you actually do the optimal decode, you can do better. And so how are you going to uh, do the optimal decode? So the actual objective of decoding is to find the most likely order synchronous but time asynchronous output, not the most likely time synchronous output. And we see the distinction between the two, right? And so what beta v finds is the most likely time synchronous symbol sequence, which you have to compress. And so uh, the likelihood of an order synchronous but time asynchronous symbol sequence is not given by the beta b decode. It's actually given by the forward probability, right? Because the forward probability sums over all possible alignments. If I give you the symbol sequence, it's giving you, if I look at the, if you go back and think of what we did when we, when we were uh, composing this graph out here, what is the forward probability of, the sum of the forward probabilities of these two guys? The sum of the forward probabilities of these two guys is simply the sum of the entire graph. There's the total probability of the entire graph. That is simply the probability of the symbol sequence on the left-hand side, right? is the probability, that is the total probability of the order synchronous symbol sequence. So if you want to really perform decoding, what you want to be doing is compu composing this graph for every possible symbol sequence, computing the alpha at the bottom right, and picking the symbol sequence for which this alpha is highest. Right? And clearly this is not going to work. You have an exponential number of these sequences. So how can we actually get around this problem? And here's how we're going to do it. 
we are going to try to find the most likely order synchronous time synchronous, asynchronous symbol sequence. So we're going to find the symbol sequence S such that alpha SKT, the, the alpha for the final symbol in that symbol sequence at the final time instant is maximized. Right? So you understand what we are trying to do over here. We are finding the symbol sequence such that the probability computed for this order synchronous symbol sequence, which is summed over all possible alignments, is highest. Okay? And of course, the problem here is that explicit computation of this is going to require an exponential number of se evaluation of an exponential number of sequences. So we'll do something simple. We'll just first organize all possible symbol sequences in a tree. Think of this. At the very first time, suppose I have only symbols blank, S1, and S2, right? What is the very first symbol that can happen? Let's assume for simplicity's sake that the first symbol can only be a blank, right? So the very first symbol is going to be a blank. Then what can follow the blank? After the blank, you can't have another blank. I'm speaking of the order synchronous symbol sequence, right? So after the blank, I can hide either have an S1 or an S2. What can follow the S2, S2, S1? After the S1, I can either have an S2, but can I have an S1 directly? No, right? I, can, I must have a blank and then I have an S1, right? But if I have a blank, S2 can also follow the blank. Right? Same thing over here. For S2, I, I can have S1 follow S2 immediately, but if I want a S2 to follow S2, I want a blank, but the blank can follow S2, right? And then from each of these guys, I'm going to have the same structure over again. I'm going to have this S2 structure following every S2. I'm going to have the S1 structure follow every S1, right? And this tree represents every possible symbol sequence that you can produce, correct? So, now, uh, every, you can keep going through this. Uh, for any depth. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to compose a graph of this kind. This graph has the tree on the left-hand side. Here I'm going bottom to top, uh, simply because it was easier for me, to, for me to draw. We've been going top to bottom in the rest of the slides. And you, my friend, are totally asleep. <laughs> Sit down. You've got five more minutes. <laughs> okay. So uh, you have, this is the tree which represents all possible decodes, right? Now I can compose the graph, and I'm composing the graph using the same rules that we had earlier, in that the arrows from one column to another column basically follow the, 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 the uh, connections shown on the vertical graph, right? So now every node over here represents a unique symbol sequence, right? That's how we compose the graph which means that every row over here represents a unique symbol sequence. So if I compute the alpha at any point, that alpha over there is the alpha for a unique symbol sequence. Right? And so now I can compose this graph and I can just compute, go left to right, and compute my alphas over this graph going left to right. The problem, of course, is this graph is going to blow up very fast. If I have 100 symbols in one time, I'm going to have 100 possible symbols. So this graph is going to blow up very fast. So when you do a beam search, what you will normally do is compose this graph, but within each column, you're going to pick the most likely, and you're going to get rid of everything that's uh, you know, more than some distance away from the most likely sequence and then just keep expanding that locally. And then when you finally get to the end, remember that each symbol sequence is actually represented by two rows. One is the final symbol in the sequence, the other is the blank that follows the final symbol. We'd be summing those two alphas to get the probability for the 
symbol sequence, you'd pick the symbol sequence for which this total alpha is largest. And that's going to give you your decode. So this is the uh, theoretically correct CTC decoder. In practice, the graph gets exponentially large very quickly. So to prevent this, we will use pruning strategies to keep the graph and the computation manageable. And uh, pruning is always going to cost some suboptimality. But uh, the fact that the CTC you know, decode by itself has this natural property that most of the probabilities are sort of compressed at the boundaries allows for very efficient pruning, pruning because the blanks consume uh, most of the probabilities in the graph, as we saw. And so uh, CTC decoding tends to be efficient, even though uh, you know, if you didn't perform pruning, the graph blows up. Yeah. That's it. You go down the column and get rid of everything that has. You know, you pick the highest probability. You say, I'm going to have a pruning threshold of, say, 10 raised to 6. So then anything that's more than the highest probability divided by 10 raised to 6, or less than the highest probability divided by 10 raised to 6, you just throw it up. Right? And so, and so here's the final slide, 20, half an hour. Sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence networks, which irregularly produce outputs, can be trained by iteratively aligning the target output to the input and time synchronous training, or optimizing the expected error or the expected divergence over all possible alignments, that's CTC training. Distinct repetition of symbols can be disambiguated from repetitions representing an extension of a single sim sim symbol by using blanks. And decoding can be performed either by best path decoding, which is Viterbi decoding, which is very easy to implement. As you saw, the pseudocode is only like 10 lines. And that pseudocode can literally be converted to Python code. Or you can perform optimal CTC decoding based on the application of the forward algorithm with pruning. And this, too, is implementationally simple, but it's not going to work because naive implementations will run out of compute and memory really, really quickly. And so uh, if you want to do pruning and beam search, you use libraries that somebody else wrote for you. <laughs> but, uh, let me uh, stop here. So the caveats, by the way, the blank structure is only one way to deal with the problem of repeating symbols. So you have the other variants, like symbols partitioned into two or more sequential subunits, like subphonemes or symbol specific blanks so you know i can have a different blank for s1 than i have for s2 for instance right i can have symbol specific blanks uh, you, and uh, other such variants are possible the actual underlying mechanism that computes the probabilities doesn't have to be a unidirectional lstm it could be bidirectional it could be simple mlps it could be anything at all whole number of combinations but the basic idea that we spoke about still sort of remains. Right? So I'll stop here. There's a few more slides. You can look, look these up in the course page. Questions? Thank you, and thank you for your patience and will.